Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Clearly, we know that uh, CO2 is the greenhouse gas that has the largest effect on climate change, but methane, um, if you look at cumulative emissions since uh, the Industrial Revolution, since 1750, the contribution to the total forcing from basically cumulative emissions of greenhouse gases is about about a quarter of the forcing is actually from methane over that time period. So 1750, the year 1750 to present day. So uh, every few years there's, uh, there's a consortium called the Global um, Methane Budget and they put together, you know, it's, it's like 75 odd authors all different disciplines and they look at methane around the planet all aspects of methane and they come up with this paper review paper called the global methane budget 2000 to 2017 and that just came out in the last month so the date is just up to 2017 and i'm discussing uh some of the key uh factors of this paper you know in this fourth and last video of my small methane series um, so the global methane budget 2000 to 2017 and just google this and get this paper and it's got all of the details um, all of the gory details about uh, methane around the planet and the key some of the key findings are that um, the the largest anthropogenic increases in methane are from fossil fuels um, fossil fuel are a big increase so methane from you know when you get oil out of the ground or um, when you mine coal or when you pull um, natural gas out natural gas is primarily methane then the methane levels in the atmosphere increase um, but also um, you know the sort the, the sinks in the atmosphere um, if those weaken or decrease and methane levels in the atmosphere will be larger and because the global warming potential is so large for methane compared to um, co2 you know it uh, even though the concentrations are much lower for methane measured typically in in parts per billion as opposed to parts per million for co2 there's a large effect on forcing and the latitudinal distribution of methane shows a pre predominance of tropical emissions about 65 percent of the global budget that's less than 30 degrees north compared to the mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere is about a third um, that's 30 to 60 north and the high northern latitudes right now the methane uh, coming from the high northern latitudes is only about four to five percent of the global total so this is a number to keep an eye on as the warming of the Arctic uh, continues to occur and as we continue to lose sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic. So um, this is a methane curve from 79 to present day. So increasing, stalling out, and then increasing. If you take the slope of this curve, the, the first derivative, you can see that the slope is positive, so the curve is increasing. It's a bit close to zero from 1999 to 2006, and then since then it's been it's been increasing again. Um, and um, look at the uh, okay. So there's uh, look at the curve here. Um, so this is showing the, the these are the emissions up to present day. And there's all of these different emission scenarios. So this will be in the next IPCC report. The SSPs, they call it, Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. It replaces RCPs, Representative Concentration Pathways, in the last IPCC report. And it shows how we expect the methane to change in the future. Um, this is the, uh, these are, um, th these are four uh, source categories, these are, these are wetlands around the planet where the emissions are high. This is in milligrams of methane per square meter per day. Um, so in these regions here, uh, you can see the distribution um, from wetlands and from fossil fuels, agriculture and waste, biomass 
and bio, um, biomass and biofuel burning. Okay, and if we go down further in this paper to uh, some of the other figures and, well, there, here's a very, very detailed uh, breakdown of global methane emissions by source type. So it's in teragrams of methane per year using both bottom-up and top-down approaches. So the bottom-up approach is take all of the things on the planet that produce methane, estimate, figure out how much methane is being produced by them, add them all up, and that should give you the, the global total. The top-down approach is use satellites up in space, looking down to measure the methane concentrations in the atmosphere. Okay, so, and hopefully those numbers will converge. Um, and if they don't, I would personally trust the bottom-up numbers more than the top-down numbers. Okay, so this is uh, 2000 to 2009 numbers. Um, uh, and this is the uh, most recent paper here. For, so the, the 2000 to 2009 numbers have been slightly modified. This is the 2008 to 2017 numbers and the numbers in 2017 in the one year. And it breaks it down into all of the different sources. These are the natural sources. These are the anthropogenic sources. And agriculture has increased significantly. Fossil fuel emissions have increased significantly. Um, and then you have the sinks. So the sinks are from tropospheric OH, stratospheric loss, tropospheric chlorine, soil uptake, okay? And if you take the sources minus sinks and the number is positive, so the methane level is increasing in the atmosphere. So all of the details are there. These are some of the uh, methane emission sources. So geological, this is the seeps and volcanoes, mud volcanoes, um, fissures in the earth where methane is seeping up. Uh, termites, surprisingly termites are a fairly significant factor for producing methane. The ocean, emissions from the ocean, so on the continental shelves around the coastlines, methane hydrates and things. And then this is the soil uptake, so where, you know, the, the rainforests and large um, vegetation areas, farming areas can, the soils can actually absorb a fair amount of, of, of methane. Okay, so uh, all the different sources are looked at in great detail. And again, I highly recommend that you have a look at it. Um, and uh, they talk about Shikov they talk about the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf and the Shikova work. And so the bubbling up from that region. Um, and... Uh, they they look at the the uh, you know there's an error range given for these and basically the Arctic um, you know they talk about hydrates okay so basically the emissions from the Arctic the so-called methane bomb has not um, been triggered yet but as we you know most of you are probably following the collapse of the Arctic sea ice this summer, you know, well, it looks like we're well on our way to setting a new record and having a much lower, lower amount of sea ice in 2012. And I'll do a, a series of videos giving you an update on that um, soon. Okay, uh, so let's just keep going down. Um, and uh, here's, here's another figure here. So this is methane global emissions um, from the different for the 2008 to 2017 decade for top down and bottom up. So we've got wetlands, significant component, biomass burnings, much smaller fossil fuels, uh, agriculture and waste and other natural emissions. Um, and I showed you this in some previous videos, the global methane budget for 2008 to 2017. We've got the anthropogenic, uh, Flexes from fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass and biofuel burning, and then we have the natural emissions, the big component being wetlands, but the other natural emissions including inland waters, geological, oceans, termites, wild animals, permafrost vegetation, 
small chunk right now, but a chunk that will, you know, we have to keep a close eye on because, you know, permafrost, um, hydrates, etc. you know, in the Arctic could start releasing huge amounts episodically, like a burst, a pulse. And these are the sinks from the hydroxide reactions in the atmosphere, chlorine, ozone, singlet oxygen, and the soil sink. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, so this is a latitudinal breakdown. So 90 degrees south to 30 degrees north. So this includes the equatorial, the tropic equatorial regions. And we can see wetlands, the breakdown to wetlands, biomass, fossil fuels, agriculture, and others. Notice the scale here, 200 at the top. If we go to the mid latitude, so about two thirds of the total methane emissions are from this region, which includes the tropical areas. About one third is in the mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere. And you can see the breakdown into the different components here. So more in fossil fuels and agriculture waste, you know, wetlands isn't as big a component. And then if you go to the scale here is 140, which comes up to about here. And this scale only goes up to 50, which is about here on this. So it's much, much smaller. So the Arctic emissions, the high Arctic emissions so far um, are much, much lower. They're, this is about four or 5% of the global total. This is about a third here, and this is about two thirds. So the Arctic explosion of methane has not occurred yet. Um, and this is a breakdown in the latitudinal bands. Uh, so this is, these are the, the numbers specifically generating those graphs. And, uh, you know, basically then the paper goes and says, well, what do we need to do in order to, um, you know, for future research? So there'll be, you know, it's a review paper. It talks about the budget. Uh, it talks about the need for additional monitoring stations. Uh, it talks about the need for a better understanding of the hydroxide and the global distribution of hot hydroxide and what produces it. Um, right? It talks so basically. I guess I should just uh, get in summary: reduce the high uncertainty in the amount of methane emitted by wetland and inland water systems and reduce double counting. Okay, some of the methodology in the previous work, uh, there was double counting. Um, you know, if you talk about wetlands, but if it's a marsh that's connected to a lake, you don't want to count both. Okay, so there's better accounting to reduce double counting. Um, better assessment of uncertainties for global methane sinks in the top down and bottom up budgets. Okay, and there's all these different things that are recommended and bet towards a better partitioning of methane sources and sinks by region and process. Um, and reducing uncertainties in the modeling of atmospheric transport in the models used for the top-down budget. Okay, how is the methane transported in the atmosphere? Because, you know, the, the lifetime of methane, um, there's something called the chemical lifetime and if you take the total concentration of methane in the atmosphere in parts per billion and you divide it by the sink rate, the rate of methane absorption in the sinks, um, then that gives you kind of the lifetime of the methane in the atmosphere and that's about works out to about nine years. If you add in the components of methane lost in the soils, etc., then that reduces the lifetime to about seven years or so. So because the, um, the lifetime of methane is so short relative to that of CO2, if we can get a better handle on methane emissions, on reducing them, then we can reduce the radiative forcing and therefore the temperature, you know, the, the uh, rate of temperature rise in the atmosphere. Um, you know, it's sort of like the low hanging fruit, if you like. So this is, uh, you know, one of the ideas of this study is to identify the sources, identify the sinks, then try to figure out if you can modify them to, uh, you know, increase the sinks, decrease the sources to get a better control of the methane budget. Thank you for listening to this video series.